Hi everyone, welcome to Talk About It Tuesday. This is Tosca Di Matteo, founder of Tosca Coaching and Consulting. And I'm here today to have a discussion about mental health with Mare Uriate, if I'm hopefully saying that exactly right. Um, and I'm really excited about this conversation because, hey Ben, thanks for joining, great to see you here. Um, I'm really excited about this conversation because like, it is so important. Um, and in fact, there will be a blog post that goes out this week um, around mental health, uh, co-written by Mare, who will be joining us shortly. Um, she is a student um, at Boston University, and she has personal experience and passion for this topic, which is why I'm having her on, especially, you know, I love that um, she has a different perspective. Um, and here she is. I'm super excited. Let's see. Let's have her on. Just waiting for her to, to join. And I'm glad all of you are here today. I'm so excited. We have a big group already. My welcome to Talk About It Tuesday. Hi. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> I can. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. We have, we have some lovely folks. I think folks who know and love you dearly um and some some fans of mine as well so i'm so glad that you're here to to share with us all uh your thoughts around mental health um and before we dive in i want to first just say that i am just so honored that you're here and that it's very courageous um to talk about taboo topics today and so it's just a testament to your strength um, to your your being a healer um, because you want to spread the word uh, to help other people and you know I consider you my part of my chosen family um, even though we haven't known each other for that long you are deeply embedded in my heart and so I'm just blessed uh, that you wanted to and agreed to be a part of this I mean, um, uh, same to you. I mean, I, I've been starting calling you Titi Tosca because you mean a lot to me as well. And I just want to thank you as well for giving me the opportunity to talk about this topic on your platform. Um, it's great that, you know, we're having these conversations out in the open. So I want to thank you as well. Oh, yes. And thank you for that. Um, you know, and I will just, I want you to introduce yourself. But another thing I want to share is, again, to let everybody who's listening know that there will be a blog post. Um, that you uh, primarily authored. I, I share a few thoughts, but that will be um, out on the blog under article section of my website, toscadimateo.com. And the other thing I want to share just on a personal note is that um, mental health means a lot of different things. And that's going to be one of the first things we talk about, which is how we define it. But, you know, it touches near and dear to my heart because there is a lot of actual schizophrenia um, within my family lineage um and depression um and so it definitely hits home um and so i'm just i i love that that we're having this conversation so without further ado like let let the audience know what, whatever you want to share about yourself like what's your journey what are you passionate about what are you studying i shared that you were going to be you um yeah uh well hi everybody um i'm mare uh i am uh, one of Tosca's friends' daughters, <laughs> but uh, she is also my friend, so. <laughs> um, I'm originally from Puerto Rico, and I'm currently in Boston doing my master's degree in international relations with a focus on diplomacy. Um, and while I'm very passionate about that topic as well, I'm also passionate about, you know, mental health awareness, just because my life has been touched by mental health um, issues. I'm also passionate about feminism. Um, I'm passionate about human rights, uh, immigrant rights, Black Lives Matter, pretty much any social justice <laughs> issue that there is out there I'm very passionate about. And I try to use my platform, no matter how tiny it is, to sort of talk about these issues and keep them current, because a lot of the time the news will report about something and it'll become cool, quote unquote, for like five minutes and then people will forget about it. So I always try to keep the conversations going, not only on my social media, but also in my cl in my classrooms here at Boston, and as well with my family and friends. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you for sharing. I mean, you know, uh, 
it's, it's, you know, it's, I think about, it's like, you know what? International relations was what I went to undergrad to study, <laughs> but I ended up, uh, it, ended up focusing in marketing. Um, so I love, um, I love, you know, that your passion for advocacy just kind of comes through so strong. Um, and, and certainly the fact that you and so many youth right now are, um, are helping drive the conversation today is important. And you're right. Things are up for five seconds and then they're down and, and, but they're really big things that the world needs to focus on. Um, and I think case in point on mental health is look at who's running our country. It's kind of what it looks like when it's not addressed. I, I mean, honestly, right? Like, and, and that, you know, it's so important for especially everybody, but also people in power to know when they have issues that are uh, actually hurting other people. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what, what in particular, like why, what are the reasons driving your passion around mental health in particular? Because you mentioned you have a lot of things that you're interested in, but why this particular? Um, I think in particular because of my personal experiences, um, if I'm being very frank and open, I've been dealing with depression and anxiety since I was about 15 years old. Um, and maybe even earlier than that, I'm just not sure because I didn't receive an official diagnosis until I was 15. Um, and I know from personal experience how lonely this illness is and how how self-centering it is just because you don't really see anything around yourself you just see you know that you are not doing well that little voice in your head that keeps telling you that you know you're not doing well that you're not succeeding in life and everything and I know how lonely and frustrating and scary it may be and um, I, I had a lot of struggles coming to terms with my depression as well as with my family um, there was a lot of, of pushing and and trying to convince, you know, my mom certainly to get to allow me to go on medication, which was a very frustrating process for me. But uh, now that I'm older, I understand where she was coming from now that she and I have had conversations about it as well. But, you know, I, this illness is something that I, I don't wish upon anybody. Um, and I'm glad that I've taken steps to work on it. Um, but I know that there are many people out there who perhaps don't have the tools or they don't have the people supporting them in order to get better. And so I want to, you know, make myself available to people who are maybe questioning whether, you know, they're actually feeling a little depressed or just the blues, you know, or, you know, I know how anxiety sometimes eats at me and I can't, you know, ask for help and I want people to know that it's okay to ask for help that it's possible to ask for help and that I'm here to help them if they need it and so based on my personal experiences and what I've gone through I just don't want anyone to feel the way that I did growing up and so that's why I talk about it so much because I, I know the battle and I know how hard it is and I, I don't want anyone to suffer the, that way in that way either mm. yeah I love what you're sharing about that it's not like it's not just you, right? So many people go through this, but I think that when people aren't exposed to others that are going through the same thing or they're not or they're not or they're scared to reach out or they're not willing to or they're afraid of what will happen if they do reach out, then it just begets this whole like loneliness, which almost feels like a cycle that happens within depression. Um, and, and I'm wondering from your experience, was it was it easy to reach out for support early on or did you have to go through a struggle of 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 getting the support that you needed like what was that like for you um it was very hard for me specifically because i just don't like talking about my feelings and i don't i i don't ever want to be a burden to someone and that's a mindset that i've mm. had to work on changing because i i'm not a burden you know when i there are people out there that I know that care about me and they would rather me be honest and tell them that I'm not doing okay rather than keep it to myself. Um, and it was actually a friend of mine who sort of gave me an ultimatum when she saw that I was at my lowest. And she said, you know, if you don't tell your mom that you're not doing well, then I'm going to tell her. 
And in that moment, I was so angry at her for sort of stepping over my toes and and not and so I felt my autonomy challenged. But if it wasn't for her, I never would have spoken up, and perhaps my life would have been different. So, you know, perhaps it wasn't executed in the best way, but she had the best intentions for me. And to this day, I'm very thankful that she pushed me to speak about it with with the people around me, because otherwise, I I don't say that I don't think I would be here, but I think my life would be very, very different if, mm. if, if she hadn't pushed me to tell my mom, hey, something's going on with me and I need help. And, and what you bring up is so important because it's not just about being educated for those who are going through, but also for those who are in positions to see others and to, and to take action, um, even, uh, even though it, there might be retaliation or even if you may not have reacted, but because of who you are, that, that moved you into action to, to take care of yourself by taking the first step of, uh, of, of sharing with your family. And, and I think you bring up another really great point in that, which is this idea of like not wanting to be a burden. And I always say that it is, it's the responsibility of the person receiving the information or whatever, the experience, for them, to, it's, it's, it's on their onus to know what is their burden and what is not their burden. But we don't always think about it this way. We just think about it. If I share with you, that means I'm putting my burdens on you. But actually, it's the person receiving it who makes the choice. Yeah to, you know, to either take it on as a burden or not. And that's, that's also a mental health that that also affects mental health, right? To know like, oh, this is not mine. This is not my problem to solve. I can just hold space and be there for whoever um, and, and whatnot. So in that journey of realizing that you're not a burden to others by sharing feelings, like what, what are your thoughts about that? Because I think that can really hold a lot of people back from sharing because of that fear that you're talking about. I think, um, I think because this isn't a topic that's talked about a lot, I feel like when you start talking about it, people start to get uncomfortable with it. And mm. perhaps they might not be um, as accepting to have these conversations. And so for the longest time, it took a lot of for, for in my personal experience, it took a lot of uh, trial and error for for me to find a, a way to communicate with my mom mm. and my family, sort of what what was wrong with me, you know. And I, my mom and I uh, did therapy last year, which was, I mean, it was monumental for our relationship. And a lot of what I told her was that when I was growing up, I just didn't feel like I had the avenue to talk with her. Mm. That if she simply would have stepped back and said, hey, like, how can I help you? That would have made me feel less of a burden to someone. So I think having these conversations is important not only to encourage people to speak out, but also to encourage people to listen. Because a lot of time you hear, but you're not listening. You really need to listen to a person when they tell you that something is wrong. And you don't just say, oh, you know, you'll get better or life will get better or whatever. You have to stop and acknowledge their pain and say, hey, I'm so sorry that you're going through this. I understand. I might not understand what you're going through, but, you know, I would like to understand more. What can I help you? What can I help you with? What can I do for you? And I think that's the first step, really, mm -hmm. in having the conversations about mental health is having people be willing to to have them and to really listen and to provide support more than anything else. Yeah. Uh, I just, <laughs> I'm just so, um, it's great to hear this, you know, coming from someone who, who has such experience because I think that, the, you know, the challenge is also as is, is on how do you, the challenge can sometimes be that once you get the courage to speak your truth, the next step is, is it may be that you, you don't find the person that can be there for you right away. And I'm not saying that's the case with you, but I'm saying that like some people might go, go to that one place that they think it will be safe. And then they realize they can't get what they need and then they don't keep going. And kind of what I heard you say in that was, 
was to, to keep searching for that place so that you can get what you need. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that's kind of what I gathered mm -hmm. is, is being able yeah. to find the people that can be there for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's very hard when you're in that mindset, especially if you get shot down once, you're going to feel mm -hmm. like you're going to get shut down again. But I also had to learn to condition myself and sort of be like, mm -hmm. hey, just because one person isn't willing to help you doesn't mean the rest of the world is. And so, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times when I felt like I couldn't go to my mom, I would go to my friends or I would go to mm -hmm. my aunt or I would go to my uh, uncles or I would go to my cousins or anything like that I would go to anybody who mm. I think would listen to me and you know and it was hard and you know I didn't I didn't want my mom ever to feel like like I didn't trust her like I couldn't go to her it's just that she was also learning how to handle these things at the same time that I was and you know, growing up, I did have a lot of anger. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I, I was very angry at my mom for a very long time. But we've sort of worked on that. And now she understands the the importance of, of being open. And, you know, I'm glad that I had other people in my life in those moments that I could go to as well. So it's important to keep in mind that, first of all, you know, just because one person isn't willing to help you doesn't mean anybody else is. And second of all, that you really aren't alone, that there's so many people out there who are going through these issues as well. And, you know, I just want to make the caveat that mental health isn't just depression and anxiety. There's so mm -hmm. many other illnesses that fall under that category. As you mentioned, schizophrenia is one of them or multiple personality disorder or dissociative identity or there's so many out there. And unfortunately, I don't have the resources to address all of those. I only can speak about depression and anxiety. But I think it applies that if you if you need help, you just got to keep looking for it until you find it. It really, you know, it's 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 out there for you. And hopefully you'll find it quickly so that it can it can help you out. But it's it's very hard in the moment, but it's important not to give up when you're looking for someone to help you out. Yeah, and and I'm so glad that you talked about that because we actually haven't really we haven't defined mental health right. We just kind of dove in, but um, yeah. And I want to say with a caveat, right? Like like I'm not a therapist. You're not a therapist. Uh, I'm not trained in treating any of the uh, you know uh, concerns that you just mentioned. But I think that 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 lived experience is so valuable for uh, you know to be able to just have conversations with people that have lived through it and, and know that um, also in the blog, there will be resources for where you can get professional help trained in addressing some of these, um, you know, these, these mental health um, concerns, but speaking of mental health, like how do you define it? Right? Because it's, it's this term that I think it's a lot of bad rap. It's taboo to bring up. Like it's, it's definitely entered the workforce in terms of a topic, but I still think it, it there's a lot of stigma attached to it. So, so from our, you know, non-therapist lives, um, like let's just talk about like what we think it means and, and have a conversation there. And, and for anybody who's joined and wants to chime in about their definition, love to hear from you too. But yeah, what do you think about that, Mane? Yeah, I think mental health is, uh, is just like physical health, but it's, it's about your mind. Um, it's your emotional well-being. Um, and your emotional well-being can domino so many other things in your life. It could domino your physical well-being. It could, uh, you know, affect p everything around you. So I think it has to do a lot of with your emotions and with your mm -hmm. mentality and how you're having conversations, not only with the people around you, but within yourself as well. And so, you know, for me, good mental health is, is being not necessarily happy-go-lucky all the time, but it's, you know, learning to recognize oh, something is, is troubling me and it's affecting my emotions. And I know that I need to address this because otherwise it's going to affect my self-esteem. It's going to affect my productivity. It's going to affect my physical health. It's going to affect, you know, just how I view the world. And so it's, it's, a, it's a complicated term to define, but I always sort of link it to how people think about physical health, but instead of focusing on the physical side of it, you focus on the mental and the emotional side of it. Yeah, I, uh, I agree with, with, with all of those things. And, and I think that for me, when I think about mental health, it, it's like, 
the thing that comes up for me is like, how are, how am I talking to myself? Like what, what, and what are the stories that I'm creating in my head also? Cause that can create some destructive thought patterns. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, you talked about the emotions being such a big part of it because um, it's, it's how it's, sometimes I see mental health as like, how are we processing emotions in, in, in a way that serves us versus a way that is destructive, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I think personally for myself, like in my, you know, for a lot of years, I buried emotions and I buried emotions and I, buried, and I didn't address them. I, 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 it got to the point, right, where I don't even know what I'm feeling sometimes because the first thing I do is, is bury them. And to mm -hmm. me, that that is mental health mm -hmm. um, because I'm not allowing what needs to come to the surface and be dealt with, be dealt with because mm -hmm. it feels really scary. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized over time that this created a habit in me that, that was destructive, that, that was eating me up inside. That was, I was storing it physically in my body. Mm -hmm. uh, these emotions because our body doesn't forget, you know, yeah. what yeah. happened to us. Yeah. I, for me, <laughs> I I feel like I have a very complex mind and I always joke that my head feels like I have 17 tabs open and I can't tell where the music is coming from. Um, hmm. But, you know, for me, mental health is being able to manage those 17 tabs um, and being able to, you know, close a tab when it's done. Um, <laughs> and when my mental health isn't at its best, then those tabs start to become overwhelming. And then... Hmm it sort of paralyzes me and I feel like I, I don't have the resources to address some of the issues that are going on in my life. And so that's why it's always important for me to sort of center myself and, you know, have that conversation with myself and check in and say, hey, how are you doing? What are the issues that we need to work on? Um, is this something that you can do on your own or is this something that you need to reach out to someone? Mm -hmm. um, personally, I'm on medication right now um, and I can't imagine my life without it. And there's no shame in taking it. It doesn't work for everybody, um, but it's worked for me. Um, and I've been on medication now for about a year uh, and it's done wonders. It really, it's a, it's a lifeline in, in an ocean, basically. That's how I describe mm -hmm. it. It's like you get tired of swimming and you're sinking and you need sort of a, a flotation device. And the, and the medication helps with that. And you know, your brain is like any other muscle in your body, I mean, if you if you have cancer, you're going to have to take your medication to get rid of cancer. If you have diabetes, you need to take your insulin to, to address that. Your mind is in the exact same way. If it's not working mm -hmm. and you need to medicate it, then that's the way to go if that's what works for you. Yeah. I, I'm curious what your – I don't know if you experienced any resistance, you know, like resistance to, to medication because I think this is, you know – a huge barrier, but that there's, there's probably many pathways. Um, and this is one pathway, but I feel like this one pathway gets a very bad rap. Um, and so like, was, yeah, was, was there resistance for you or were you like, Hey, if that's something that will help, I'm totally on board. I'm, I don't care, you know, what other messages I may have received in society. Like, what was that journey like for you on like, accepting medication as a total viable solution for what you were experiencing. Yeah. Um, I, in my head, I had this idea of what depression looked like and I didn't think that it looked like me mm -hmm. um, because I feel like a lot of media out there sort of glorifies it or, or portrays it in a very weird way. Mm -hmm. And so when I, I first went on medication when I was 16, um, and when my therapist first brought it up, I was I was confused. I was like, no, I I'm not at that point. No, that's impossible. Mm -hmm. Like I no, I'm not I'm not like those people that I see on TV or in movies or anything like that. That can't be me. Um, and so my therapist sat me down and said, hey, like depression looks different on everybody. It doesn't. It's not a, a blanket thing that looks the same on everybody. Um, and then after that, it was, it was fear on having to depend on something for the rest of my life. Mm. Um, and that's when I started 
to sort of shift that conversation within me and address my brain as any other muscle in the body. You know, it's not, it's not that I'm building a dependency on it. It's that it's what I need to get mm. better. It's what I need to function. It's what, it's what works for me. And so it took a, it took a couple of years really to change that mentality. And a lot of it was, was having these kind of conversations and, you know, with my therapist and being like, this is what I'm thinking about right now. Like, am I right? Am I wrong? What do you think? Um, and so it took a while, but, but I feel like I'm in a good place now where, you know, if you need the medication, then, then you need it. And there's really no shame in that at all. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're weak. It doesn't mean that you can't do it. It just means that you need a little something extra, you know, because your brain isn't producing the chemicals that you need to function. It's not your fault. It's just nature. And it, mm -hmm. and, and it happens and you have no control over it. And so I think it's important. It was important for me to realize that. And I think it's important for people to also realize that as well. Hmm. Uh, I, and Diva Lionheart is sharing here that the Medicaid, that, that uh, she says you're preaching, which I love. And it's true um, that our own perception of depression never looks like what we think. Um, yeah, it's like how we, we, we receive images and messages about what things look like that are off it. you know as we know what the media does with things you know uh what things are glorified what things get shown um and certain stories get told and not all stories get told and not all faces get shown and 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 so i think it can be very hard to identify i don't care what we're talking about whether it's depression or, or some other experience that when we don't see ourselves represented about what it looks like, it's very hard for us to see it in ourselves because we yeah. don't know how to identify. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And um, a lot of what I strive for in life is to be intersectional um, mm -hmm. in every aspect of my life. And I mean, I can only speak on my experience as a Latina, but you know, I, uh, like you said, all of the representations of depression that I ever saw were of white women or of white men. Um, and I know I've read a lot of statistics on, you know, people, black people in the black community who have a hard time addressing mental illness because the resources aren't there for them. And mm. for me personally, as a Latina, you know, I was I was raised in a household where you just keep moving forward. Like mm. the world may be burning, but you keep moving forward and you don't have time. You don't have time for depression. You don't have time for anxiety. You don't have time for that kind of thing. Um, and while that mentality has helped me learn a lot of things, it's also very detrimental because it, it, it then it then taught me that I I couldn't I couldn't look for help. That mm. you know, that I I had no avenue to look for help, that I you know, there are people in the world who are suffering much more than I am, you know, and so it's it's very important that when talking about these conversations you also keep other aspects of society in mind. Um, you know, whether it's race or sexuality or ethnicity or gender, um, you know, how you identify gender wise. Um, it's not, you know, it's like feminism. It, it also has to be intersectional because it affects any type of person and it affects different people differently and different people have different resources that they can go to and other people don't have those same resources. So I think that it's also important to talk about those aspects as well. Oh, my gosh. I'm so glad you brought that up and shared because, you know, having worked for um, Univision, uh, the number one Hispanic media company, I was exposed to, you know, what happens in certain cultural experiences, like what gets indoctrinated that um, especially around uh, what, what you're talking about, right? Like that you just keep going or or whether it's this idea of you should be grateful because like you have so much more than we had. And so just deal with it, make it work or don't ask for more for yourself. You know, like these kinds of these added cultural nuances um, to topics that uh, are already taboo. I think some of them are even more taboo in uh, for, 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 for people who are first generation from, from a, a number of different places. Um, 
And to me, I think it's about, as with anything, questioning what is it that I believe versus what is it, what are those beliefs that have been indoctrinated into me or that have been told to me that I've adopted as my own, but they may not be my own. Mm -hmm. Like, I may be resistant to medication, but is it really my resistance or is it because others have told me I should be resistant? Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious when we layer on race, gender, ethnicity, all these other things as it relates to mental health, like what are the kinds of things that you would counsel other people on as it relates to these things? Um, Well, I would go back to what I said at the beginning is that being willing to listen is very important um, and asking the, a, a person whoever comes up to you and says, hey, I, I have this issue I need to, to deal with to, to offer your help and to offer, you know, your support. I think that that is something that could be applied um, intersectionally wise. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's so much harder to do that in practice. Um, so I think that keep, to have these conversations and to also read up on information. I know that when I first started really thinking about the intersectional side of mental health, I had to read a lot of stuff in order to educate myself. Um, And I think that's also very important is educating yourself and exposing yourself to things outside of your bubble. Because like I mentioned, not, you know, depression doesn't treat everybody the same way and not everybody has the same resources. And so, you know, it's the willingness to listen, it's the willingness to be supportive and show that support with actions and with words. And it's also educating yourself on these issues. Mm. Yes, I, this, the idea of education, right? Like, because I think sometimes when we grow up only knowing one way or one way of being or one way that our household looks or, or the way that we're treated by our parents, we think, oh, like, this is what normal looks like. Or this is okay because this is my lived experience. Mm -hmm. And then if we're not exposed to like, hey, this actually isn't healthy or actually this is detrimental, um, then it becomes harder to know that we even have something to look harder at, (laughs) you know? Like, so I think some of it is like even being aware of like, oh, is it nor like, is it okay, you know, for example, that. I'm, I'm totally making it up that, you know, I've been told not to trust doctors, my, my, you know, for my entire life, you mm-hmm. know, and, and like, is that a healthy thought or is that a thought that, that, you know, that is hurting me in some way? Um, and then, like you said, taking that next step and, and looking into it mm-hmm. um, because we also are the receivers of other people's, mental health challenges right like we're like you know when we're walking around with a bunch of traumatized people in this world that haven't healed themselves and then if we're not careful we become a victim of other people not having handled their mental health challenges like again president you know case in point um and so how can we better understand even what other people may be going through and realizing that we're now, we've become a victim of their behavior. And, mm-hmm. and how do we protect ourselves? How do we acknowledge it? How do we get out of toxic situations? Because I think that's part of mental health is not just ourselves, but also how are we dealing with the external influences of people that are walking around a hot freaking mess, which is, <laughs> I, think, I think, why this world is in the situation that we're in, because there's so much healing that needs to be done in order to treat each other better yeah um but that's my little soapbox I digress <laughs> yeah um yeah so do you like it sounds like you've you know you found some solutions for yourself in how in in how to manage uh your your mental health um and yeah, I mean, maybe we can just give people a little bit of preview about what's in the blog around what are the tools in your toolbox that you use to support your mental health, especially like you're you're in you're in grad school, like you you mentioned earlier, right? Like you're in another city, you're not with your family, you know, they're not around you. I know you have other support there, but like then you have like virtual environment, I, you have like jobs, like 
Like, what are the tools you're using in the, especially this moment in time to, to help? Yeah. Um, so I, I again, want to caveat these work for me. I don't, yeah. I'm not saying that this is a cure all for everybody, but these work for me. Um, I think, I think it having, when I'm feeling overwhelmed or overly anxious or, or I, I know my, my signs when I'm not doing well. Um, the first thing is to sit down and, and sort of see what's, what's really going on and what I can do to, to solve these. So, um, I say in the blog that I like to joke that my middle name is anxiety because if I'm not anxious, I don't think I, I'm me, um, which is not a great way to live. But unfortunately, that's how I live. And so a lot of the time when I'm feeling very anxious, I feel like I can't vi visualize what I can get done or what needs to be done. And so what helps me is to write lists. Um, I, I have my notebook right here. This is some of my to do's for the week. Um, and it helps me not only visualize what needs to get done, it also helps me to prioritize what needs to get done and what, yeah. you know, doesn't really need to get done at the moment. And like, sometimes I'll be mm. like, oh, I, I need to pay rent. Yeah, but that's in a month. You know, that can go a little bit on the bottom of the list for right now. Um, and so that helps me out. And then putting a little check mark after it just makes me feel accomplished. Like I actually got something done. Um, yeah, and I want to uh, pause on that one just for a second because so many of the clients that I help, right, they deal with overwhelm at some point. At some point in my, you know, working with a client, you know, they're going to get on the call and they're going to feel like, you know, spinning. Um, and and I think so often, uh, and, and look, I get into it too. <laughs> like, I'm not, you know, like, um, and I think so often what what's helpful is really just like you said, coming down to like what's really important in this moment, what really matters. And so even though I'm, I'm kind of pausing on this because when you talk about a list, right, we can easily dismiss it to say, okay, duh, you know, but as a way of managing, as a way of actually externalizing everything that's inside, right? And some people actually do this right before bed. And I, I, I do this sometimes too when I get, when I'm in like, a little bit of a overwhelm period. And sometimes I just try to like, oh, all the things that I, I need to do this week and I just kind of dump it, you know? Um, and, and I just, yeah, I, I agree on what I'm saying. is like, I totally agree that that can be really helpful in finding focus and clarity so that you can mentally separate out and physically even, right, separate out. These are the things that matter. These don't. And even, you know, I'll go a step further and say some people, if they're, you're very physical and tactile, you can write them all on different pieces of paper, put them in the tomorrow jar, you know, and like physically put that, you know, that can be a, a, a tip, too. So, yeah. OK, sorry. Sorry for like interrupting that. But I, I think it's a great uh, it's a great tool yeah. um, that we can use in a few different ways. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Even the simplest things, like, you know, I have a cat at home, and sometimes I'm so overwhelmed I forget to clean the litter box. Um, I apologize to my roommates. <laughs> <laughs> um, even the little things, that I, like, change the litter box. Like, if, all those little things, I, if I write them down, I know that I need to get them done, and I can visualize them. Um, another thing that really helps me out is movement. Mm. Um you know, right now in quarantine, I, it's been very hard to get any exercise done and even finding the motivation to just go outside without, you know, being afraid of exposing yourself or exposing the people around you. Mm -hmm. um, but I found that even like 30 minutes of movement for me is is magical, whether that's, you know, going on a walk. Thankfully, I have a very beautiful park next to me that I go on a lot of walks or, you know, doing yoga in my in my room and you know, I don't do the yoga for, I always like to make fun of my mom for this, but like for all the aligning of the chakras and all of that or whatever, <laughs> um, I do it for the, for the stretching because it makes my body feel good. Um, and in turn, it makes my mind feel good. Um, so yeah, so movement for me is very important. And I, I do try my best to get that movement in every day. And if I don't, then I don't, and I don't punish myself for that. And then for days where I really feel like I, you know, it's a fast paced day, I don't have time to go on a walk, I don't have time to do this, I don't have time to do that, I make sure that I carve out at least five minutes to myself. Mm -hmm. And I do something in those five minutes that bring me joy. 
So, you know, I, at the beginning of quarantine, I started doing little dance parties around my room, just putting on music that I really like and dancing around for like five minutes just to get the energy going or, you know, to relax or I'll put on some music that I really like or, you know, I'll call my mom or I'll call my brother or I'll call a loved one and I'll check in on them because those five minutes really does help center myself and does really help me check in and make sure that I'm okay. Um, yeah, and then another thing, you know, when I feel like, I, like I've like i gone through my toolbox and I've reached the bottom and I still feel terrible is, is to seek help. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, whether that is going to my mom and telling her, hey, I don't feel okay, like, can you listen to me? Or whether that's uh, booking an appointment with my psychiatrist or my psychologist and being like, hey, something's going on and I, I need some help because I can't manage it myself. Um, and I think it's important, you know, to not feel like a failure when you're on there. It's just that you don't have the right tools and that's okay because you shouldn't have all of the tools to deal with everything. And it's okay to go and, and get tools from someone else, basically. Yeah, you know, it's like, it's, we are going to be learning about ourselves our entire lives, right? Like what works for us because what worked for us yesterday may not work for us tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And like you said, then we may have to find new tools in the toolbox or we might have to dig deeper about wh why isn't this shifting for me, you know? Um, oh, and water, everybody hydrate mm -hmm. all the time. It does wonder. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's this guy. Um, that does like LinkedIn education. And he said he uses this statistic that like uh, uh, something around how much energy we lose when we start getting dehydrated. Like if you lost your energy, just hydrate and you'll get like 30% of your energy back or something. I'm not like quoting it right. But um, yeah, that's that's a huge practice to to put intention into into your into your body into hydration into nutrition or whatever it is that you feel like you need to to take care of yourself mm -hmm. um and yeah there was something you had said about um yeah the the physical piece right like i, I just i want to pause on that a little bit and get a little bit on a soapbox because i love what you're sharing around like you know getting movement um, shaking it out. And even you talked about like listening, uh, listening to music, um, because like music are vibrations, right? And like, and at, the, and at the end of the day, that's what helps move energy, just like water, water is moving energy, because we're like 80% water, or whatever that data is, you can see I'm not a scientist. Um, and, and so I think sometimes we get these like frou frou ideas about like okay whatever yoga but like no 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 let's look at, actually if you really look at it and look at the science of it yes like it, these things make absolute sense and there's so many different kinds of modalities you know like I use cranial sacral therapy to move uh, energy in my body I use yoga you know there's sound meditation sound healing and there's a lot of this stuff that's accessible even in um, in the time of coronavirus. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of like virtual, there's like drumming uh, and shamanic journey stuff. I know some of this might sound new to people, but, but that I guess, again, in dealing with some of my clients, a lot of it is experimentation and like not giving up that you can find what works for you to give yourself relief mm -hmm. um, from whatever mental anguish you, you know, you may be experiencing. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm curious, uh, like, and, and the, the thing you mentioned around like yoga and for you, right. It's about stretching and how that, how you see that impacting your body, which is maybe a different driver for why somebody else might do yoga. And that's okay because it's not a, we use things how they serve us. They don't have to like fit the definition of what we think it's for, mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess I'm wondering if part of this has been trial and error for you or if you kind of you picked up these things right away and you kind of knew or did you experiment and you realized some things weren't helping you and kept searching? Oh, it was definitely trial and error. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I mean, there's some things that work for me in the short term, but there are some things that work for me 
almost every time. Um, so, you know, I had a lot of people actually recommend yoga to me. And I was like, no, I'm not that kind of person. Because again, I had a perception of what people who do yoga look like. Um, <laughs> and then eventually, I just, you know, stopped being a pessimist and 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 really tried it out and and I got out of it what I needed not necessarily what everybody gets out of it um yeah and then you know I feel like there's I I try a lot of things in life because I'm very curious and mm. sometimes they work and sometimes they don't and that's fine um but yeah you know I think it's important to to definitely explore and, and see what works for you and it's very important to listen to your body and listen to your mind. I think that's, you know, I think people are like, oh, yeah, uh, you know, people paint because they're talented and because they can get something out of it. Um, that's not always the case. Some people paint because they think it's fun and, you know, they might not be Picasso, but it, it helps for them. And and that's it. You know, I feel like I've had to learn that when you're when you're taking care of yourself you have to be incredibly selfish um and that's I, I don't feel like that's in my nature to be selfish and so I've had to learn to be selfish with myself um and I'm still learning every day to be selfish with myself because I mm. I feel like I'm a very empathic person and I I want to help everybody out to my own detriment um but definitely it's it's listening to your body and its needs and and really understanding what works and what doesn't and i feel like that's the important aspect of finding things that work for you when when you're not feeling your best yeah i'm oh again totally gonna save this and play it for my clients and be like look <laughs> don't take my word for it i want you to listen to mine because she's got great well, advice well i'm not an expert but i <laughs> no no but you know I, you know it's one thing to say we're not professionally trained, right, to, uh, therapists to help people through diagnosable issues, right, that need experts in that area. But it doesn't mean we should, we cannot diminish and we should not diminish our experiences with our own healing mm -hmm. and our own experimentation mm -hmm. um, as well. Um, and sometimes it is people like you and I that makes things accessible to people because, because they see themselves in us. And that can be a gateway and a doorway to to people yeah. then exploring folks who can deal with, you know, bigger, bigger uh, topics that we're not right trained to to support people on. Um, and I think you use a couple of words that I that I want people to really think about in a deeper way, because we've talked a lot about perceptions of things perceptions about what mental health looks like perceptions about like what yo who yoga is for or perceptions right and what you, you what you talked about was cu having curiosity and and, ex and a mindset of experimentation um and I, I think those are really big messages for anybody out there who's like you know scared or afraid uh, to reach out uh, how can you allow yourself to look at it like what am I going to experiment with today around my mental health or what is it that I'm curious about that we you know that that I want to learn more about um and that can help us stay open because what I'm hearing from you is you have it sounds like part of who you are or maybe part of how you've come to to address the things in your life that you want to break free from is is an openness and and it's like I think for a lot of people, even getting to openness it, it is a challenge. Um, and I'm curious, like, what what are the things that helped you to be open? What what was supportive for you in yeah, like almost like finally doing the yoga thing, or like what 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 happened there? Um. I don't know if I have an exact answer for you, but I think I think it helps that I am a very curious person and and when people mention stuff to me, I think I like to read up a lot on on it. So um again, focusing on the yoga, I started really reading about mm -hmm. not just like the practice of yoga and what it involves, but the the benefits of doing it, mm -hmm. about the stretching, about this and about that and how it affects um and um you know, I 
I also suffer from insomnia. I have terrible sleeping habits. Um, and one of the things that drove me to try yoga is that it helps with sleep. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't help me with sleep every time, but it has helped a lot, especially in teaching me to calm my mind down so that I can fall asleep. Mm -hmm. And I think that reading, reading that and knowing that I could potentially do something to help me with feeling so tired all the time um, is really what pushed me. So I think a lot of the times when I when I feel like I'm hesitant to try something, I I do research and I educate myself on it. Um, so, yeah, I, I I I don't I don't know. It's a really weird question. I've never really thought about it, but I think that that's one of the main things that I do is 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 really try to read up as much as I can on something before I try it out if I'm feeling hesitant about it. Yeah, no, I appreciate you answering and it makes perfect sense. And I know it is it is a hard question because it, you know, how we become open is complicated, like how we, you know, how, you know, that that is certainly mm -hmm. um, and what how I kind of see your response to that is that your your go to is research and understanding. And so you it sounds like one you use that as a way mm -hmm. of discovering Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that that, that kind of framework, I, I would say, you know, for, again, for those watching, what is your go-to and then how can you use that to, uh, to become more curious or to explore yeah. possibilities? Like first, and I love what you said earlier about painting that like, if creative outlets is your go-to for things, then how can you set an intention for that creativity to allow you to find openness in other areas of your life. And I don't know what the hell that might look like. It could be like, you know, uh, you, you paint through a struggle and try to find an answer within yourself, right? It's almost meditative maybe in that, in that kind of yeah. um, approach. Um, yeah. I and, feel like a, like a lot of it is just, you know, trying to, trying to change that mentality that whatever you're, you're, using for yourself has to have some sort of outcome it doesn't really have to have an outcome it just has to work for you um and then uh, thinking about your question more another thing is asking people to do things with you i mean a lot mm. of the time if i'm scared to do something on my own i ask around and i'm sure i'll find someone mm. who will do it with me um you know when i lived in new york i was always very interested in in the idea of like boxing or kickboxing or whatever but i was always afraid to do it on my own and i got my mom to do it with me and and that's how i started it and it was great um and when i switched to being a vegetarian she also started with me too although she gave up pretty quickly but it was <laughs> <laughs> you know I, my point being is that you know if you're scared to try something for yourself then find someone else to do it with you and i'm sure that there are people out there who have the same interests as you and who will mm. be willing to explore things with you as well i i love that and it makes me think of actually in my own life that i often as a way of self protecting is I might ask somebody to do something with me, but I'm not vulnerable in saying like, this means a lot to me because, yeah, you know, because somebody could easily say, no, I'm not interested in that. Um, but, but sometimes we can, by being vulnerable and saying, you know what, this is something I really want to do for a long time. I know it's not something you're interested in, but it would really mean a lot to me. If you join me, you know, I, I think that that's, just something to be aware of, um, especially I think as, you know, I think a lot of us are the collective, right, is, is, is dealing with isolation, is dealing with coming up against winter and, and, and sorry, I'm running out of battery. So I'm looking for my charger. Ah, no worries. I'll distract the audience as you as you as you plug in. Um, and I, I know we only have a few minutes left. But, um, but that that now is the time to really like listen to what Mare is saying about getting the support that you need, you know, because we all need it now more than ever. And nobody is uh, unique in, in their desire to connect and their, their feel, you know, possibly feeling lonely at this time. Um, and there are solutions and there are ways um, to explore with others, even in isolation, because there's a lot of access mm -hmm. um, certainly virtually with, all kinds of things um so yeah um 
So I'm, I, we covered so much ground, um, and I'm curious in these last few minutes, like, is there anything else that you, you know, that's coming up for you that you really want to share that you want people to know um, regarding this topic of mental health and, and um, yeah, as we, as we wrap? Yeah, um, you know, I, I'm very, you know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and I was very vocal on social media um, about resources and everything like that, but I don't want people to think that I only think about these things in May. <laughs> I don't. Um, I think about them every day of my life, um, mm. and I think, you know, what I want, what I want people to take away from this and to, to sort of think about is, you know, that this this is an issue that really doesn't need to be taboo anymore. Um, this is an issue that, that, you know, affects millions of people in the world every day. Um, and this is something that can sometimes be hidden. You know, they say that the most depressed people in the world are the happiest. And mm. I think that it's important to be open, um, not just in your thoughts, but in how you perceive people. Um, and really be aware of, of people's behavior, especially the people that you love, um, to check in with people. I know that this pandemic has pushed me to check in with people that I don't normally check in with on a daily basis, just because I wanna make sure that people are doing okay if there's, and if there's anything that I can do for them that I, I'm there for them. Um, and, you know, I, I've said this several times in my own social media, but it, even if we might not have the best relationship or we don't talk anymore or anything like that, that doesn't mean that I don't care, you know, and that if you feel like I said something that really resonates with you and you want to talk to me about it, I'm open to it. I, you know, it doesn't matter whether I speak with you every single day or whether I speak with you once a year or whether we were friends in the past and we're no longer like, it doesn't matter. I, I want to be open and I want to be there for people who need it. Um, and I, I feel gratitude when people tell me, oh, because you mentioned this, I've started thinking about it or I've taken a step forward that, you know, it's not, it's not my goal in life to receive those kind of, achieve, uh, of messages. Um, because I, I, you know, I just want to know that I'm making a difference. That's really all I care about. Um, so yeah, I just want people to know that it's okay not to be okay, um, not to be hard on yourself. You know, these are things that I wish I heard when I was 15, um, that there are plenty of people who are going through the same thing, um, that there are plenty of resources out there, that you're not alone, and that, you know, I hear you, I believe you, I love you, like, you know, I'm here for you. That's, that's really all I want people to know. Ah. Uh. Wow. Well, you are certainly making an impact every time that you share your truth, every time that you, you share these messages. Um, and, and I say that because I also am in a world of service and, and I know that we may not hear how important it is that we're doing our work, uh, when we want to hear it or in the moment or even anywhere near the moment but that you know i just want to say thank you for for being so courageous for being so willing to share your experiences and, and be vulnerable and honest and 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 hold out your hand to others um because like that's that's the thing that you know, that this world needs so much more of, and, and you, sh you're just like a shining example of, of, uh, of what we need right now. Um, thank you. And thank you for letting me come on here and talk about this. And, you know, I just want to leave everybody with my personal mantra, which is I can, and I will watch me. Yes. What a perfect note to end it on. And if anybody does want to reach out to you, what do you want them to do it over Instagram? Like, how can they do that? Yeah, you're more than welcome to, to send me a private message on Instagram. I'm totally available for anybody who'd like to talk more. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Mari. Uh, I look forward to many more conversations. And uh, I wish you the best in this school year. And can't wait to go to your graduation. Thank you. Thank you. Love you very much, Titi Tosca. <laughs> Love you too. Talk soon. Bye.
Bye. Ciao for now. Mm-hmm.